Uh, so anybody who's on the Zoom call, I apologize. I did not start it on time. But all you missed was the announcements so far. So uh, we can follow up and you can take a look at them in the lecture notes. Um, okay. So uh, the data science lifecycle. Um, let me just make sure this thing's recording. All right, so the first thing we want to do is frame the problem, okay? So in other words, uh, we need to kind of identify, like we, what we want to do up front is, is start to think about what, you know, problem space we want to look at, right? So when I was talking about the 311 data, we want to look at, say, 311, right? We want to understand uh, maybe, you know, not necessarily come up with all the questions yet, because sometimes you want to see the data to inform what questions should be. But maybe some sort of idea of, hey, we want to look at 311 data. We want to look at it for the whole city, or maybe we only want to pick certain neighborhoods, but we want to think a little bit about how are we going to frame that problem. Then the next thing is we collect that raw data. So that data may be public, it may be private. Okay, so like the 311 data, for example, is private only, I think, primarily because it does have what I what we call PII. So PII is short for personally identifying information. And you'll probably hear me like accidentally say it. Uh, I, I'm not going to test you on it. But if you hear me say PII, what I'm talking about is like name, email address, home address, you know, phone numbers, you know, all that, all that private information. So there may be some of that information in 311 data. So as a result, it's private. However, a lot of the city's data is actually public and you can actually find it at a website called data.boston.gov. So if you wanna know, for example, how busy the blue bikes are, and this is something we will do later in the course, uh, you can actually go download that data. Uh, you can also find out where all, you know, the big belly trash cans, the ones that like compress trash, you can find out where all those are in the city too. I don't know why that's a data set, but hey, you know, it can be fun. Um, so you collect the raw data, however you're gonna get it. Then you have to process the data. And this is where you spend often a lot of the time is trying to figure out between kind of processing the data and exploring the data, making sure that the data set you have is good. And usually that is referred to as, as clean data, okay? And when we say clean data, as distinguished from dirty data, and this is again where we steal words from English and kind of use them like they, they are in English. Um, when we clean data, that means that there's no bad information in it, as you might imagine, right? So you imagine that because of some glitch, one of the blue bikes comes up as having, you know, gone 3,000 miles today. Probably a bug, right? Probably not true. So what you want to do is find out where that problem, where the problems are, and just and make decisions. So this is where it gets a little dicey. Okay. So let's take a, let's take a little poll, right? Is it valid to remove that row from the blue bike data that is the 3,000 miles one? What do you think? Yes, raise your right hand. No, raise your left hand. Okay. So unfortunately, the answer is kind of. All right. So basically, it's probably a good idea to remove that data. However, when you're presenting the information later, you want to make sure that you carefully document that you remove certain data and why. Okay. So there's other examples, which of course I can't think of right this second, where it's probably not a good idea to remove the data, okay? But a lot of the time when you're cleaning up data, you are gonna want to clean it. You're gonna wanna make it clean. Otherwise you're not gonna be able to do anything with it later, but you need to be careful about documenting what you did, okay? Does anybody know why that might be? Like, why is it so important to document your data? You need to be able to explain why have you excluded certain anomalies in other parts of the data. Okay, why do you need to be able to explain it? Or else the final result might not be like a sense easily understood by whoever you're presenting the data to, and you need to make the results clear. Good. And yeah. The solution, like you have to show how you get to that solution. Right. So it's kind of like, you know, if you're remembering like secondary or lower school, right, or whatever, show your work basically, okay? And the reason you have to show your work is so that somebody else can replicate your work so that everyone believes your work, 
All right, has anybody ever heard of the example that uh, you can lose weight by uh, eating off of smaller plates? Has everybody ever heard this before? Okay, raise your hand if you've heard of this. I just don't know how commonly known it is. Did you know that um, while it may be true that the scientists who put that together, it's completely false? Why? Because they, they, didn't have the, they didn't actually have the data. The whole thing was manufactured. So it could very well still be true, but the data set that the particular scientist used was BS, just completely false. Uh, they also had a bunch of other things. They made a ton of money in consulting uh, with various organizations. So another, another classic one, which I always thought was really interesting, is that, um, so, you know, a lot of companies have free snacks, right? So they will often be on shelves. If you put the cheap snacks at eye level versus the expensive snacks, uh, you will spend less money and yet have the same happiness in your population, right? Uh, that also is apparently false, or at least the data that that person used to create those rules was manufactured. So that's kind of a gross example, but uh, I found it really, really interesting because most of them, right, I, I assume, right, they, they all sound pretty plausible, you know, I, but it's it's kind of depressing that there's no actual data behind them. All right, so that's why you want to, so first you want to clean your data, but you also need to be able to articulate why and how you clean that data. Um, okay, so then when you explore the data, does anybody know what I might mean by exploring the data? I mean, obviously it's exploring, but what kinds of things might you do to explore data? Look for trends. So look for trends, okay. Anybody, any other ideas? Yeah. I'd look for ways to like visualize it, like graphs, charts, data. So graphs can help you visualize it and maybe get some ideas about the data. Different ways you can manipulate it. Perhaps different ways you can manipulate it. So all of these things are perfectly valid. There's also lots and lots of others. But basically what you're trying to do is you have your data set, it's largely clean. Now you want to explore it and kind of look for the kind of issues that you're interested in actually diving into. Because remember, we're just talking about kind of the data science process here. Some of these steps kind of blend together a lot of the time, right? But you kind of want to at least consciously at some point say, okay, yes, I did that one. Yes, I did that one, right? Even if the, the activity you did to, to do them was even just kind of one activity. Does that make sense? If you're aware of what the process is, you're less likely to miss anything. All right, and then perform your in-depth analysis, okay? And so this is where in the exploring the data, you might discover that 311 data tends to have an equity issue, okay? And you're like, hmm, that's interesting, right? And say you hadn't come to this class and you didn't hear me talk about this before, you look at it and you go, this is weird. Why do we have so many more reports and, um, and then actions on those reports in the back bay? which is one of the neighborhoods of Boston versus in Roxbury, which is another neighborhood in Boston. Um, and so you might say to yourself, I'm interested in trying to figure out why that is, okay? And so that's where you get into your perform the in-depth analysis. And then lastly, and somewhat most importantly, communicating the results. And, it, and the communication of the results should take into account all those prior steps, right? Where you kind of said, okay, this is why data source, this is where it came from, because even that can be invalid, right? Like going back to the guy who did the, uh, the food analysis stuff, nobody found where the data came from, right? So nobody checked. So you wanna make sure you prove where the data came from, what your source was, then what you did to clean it. And then you can usually, you don't usually kind of report on the exploration component. That's more for yourself to try to figure out what to do next. But then the in-depth analysis, that's the obvious thing that you would report. Uh, and then now you have a full, complete uh, kind of, you know, idea that may lead to something like policy change, excuse me, or lead to something like, uh, you know, can we find more equitable ways, for example, of getting three one reports handled and reported. Um, so, make sense to everybody? All right. Um, just realize I lost my third window. All right, so next up, let's talk about links. So there was an article published, I don't remember when this was, it was a while back, uh, a few years now, definitely. But then uh, there was, and a whole slew of them came out. Basically, when you have something like this come out, 
it tends to cause lots of you know reporting and articles and that kind of stuff usually all saying basically the same thing because there was one study right that somebody did but now everybody wants to drink coffee because you or have an excuse to drink coffee right so so three coffees a day is linked to um is linked to a range of health benefits and so what might we think about this in the sense of okay so it's linked to what would that mean to you? Go ahead. So they have to like, approve the causation. Okay, so it could be that there's a causal relationship. Okay, and causal, if you kind of think about what that word sounds like, just means kind of like because, right? So this is implying that drinking three coffees a day will cause health benefits. That's not actually what it says, right? What does it say? Like what's the next maybe step back? Or they're associated. They're associated. Okay. There's so sorry. There's correlation between so we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Um, so so they're associated. Okay. And so associated is kind of the formal term we use to indicate that there's a link. Okay. So you might use the word link, but the, the word we use in this class and for the rest of you know any other data science you take would be they're associated. Okay. Now an association can have a like kind of a stronger relationship than just an association okay which might be that they're correlated okay or causal and they're almost like steps right so you have an association okay yes we found people were healthier who drank three cups of coffee okay but then we have a correlation which just says hey there's a there's a, they follow along all the time okay and that means that you know it's just always correlated Okay, an association may not actually show kind of a full correlation. But then the next step is causal. And nothing here tells us for sure that three cups of coffee equals health benefits. Maybe one of you, can you think of an example of why that may not be true? Any other ideas? Maybe like the people they gathered the data from had something else in common that wasn't just like coffee. Right. So one of the one of the things could be that they actually just were all healthier, right? Who knows? Especially if what they were looking for was people who drink coffee. I thought I saw somebody over here. Yeah. Uh, let's say uh, even though it says coffee is beer, not sure if it's latte or if it's just americano or if it's just espresso. We're not sure what kind of coffee. Yeah. 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 So maybe like what she said, maybe they were already healthy in the first place and. Coffee was just something they had in common. Well, or, or maybe it's milk, right? Yeah. Like, so I don't drink milk in my coffee, right? Does that mean I don't get the health benefits? And it's actually the milk in the coffee, and they happen to pick whatever 200, uh, you know, the people that they were looking at uh, all took milk in their coffee. So, so there's a lot of different possibilities here, right? And so that's what you want to be careful of. So we can say there's a correlation, but we don't know that it's causal without doing a study specifically around looking for a causal relationship. And what we have to do then is control for other kinds of variables, right? All right. So what about this one? Do you think this is a stronger relationship than the prior one? All right, somebody said no. Um, yeah, right on. I think it's it's probably about the same. Obviously, we're not looking at the real study, but you know, this tweet. But so, you know, a little chocolate is good for your heart. Uh, there's actually, this is also, this is from 2019. I think there's actually been some more recent data that says it, it actually probably is. Um, it is probably some level of causal. Um, but, you know, at the time that this came out, it was pretty just correlated. So, eat some chocolate. Um, okay, so the kind of study that we were talking about there is what's called an, a, an observation study or using observation to determine something, okay? And it's kind of exactly what it sounds like in the sense that you observe a couple of groups and you take notes on whether they have coffee or whether they have chocolate and then you look at them maybe sometime later and look at their health status, right? So if I have a little magnifying glass i'm super into um very bad ui elements this is i'm, I'm i really wish i could do better but this is the best i can do uh so that's a keyword 
This is the kind of thing that will show up on tests and quizzes and et cetera. Okay, so these are the things you want to make sure you know what the word is and its definition. Okay. All right. So when you're looking at a, you know, a study of some kind, all the things in the study are what referred to as individuals. So when you're talking about the coffee and chocolate example, those individuals are humans, but individuals also the term we apply for any unit that is participating. Okay, so if we were trying to determine if, you know, uh, camels eating chocolate was health beneficial to the camels, they would also be individuals, right? If the, you know, whatever, think of an example. Point is, the term individual is what we use to indicate all the members of the study, whatever they may be. All right, and then the treatment, the treatment is what we did to the individuals. Okay, now what we did could be just something that they did on their own, but it's the thing we're tracking, okay? So in the two cases I just showed, it's coffee consumption and chocolate consumption, okay? So that's the treatment, okay? So treatment, most of you probably think of like medical treatments, okay? And you'll often see these in medical studies, but a treatment in this sense, uh, in the data science sense, is just kind of whatever it is that you're looking at that you're trying to study. And then the outcome is the, you know, result. Okay, so do they have better health or worse health? Uh, and so, you know, and theoretically, you're going to tie it back to based on the treatment. So in other words, you know, they have health benefits, whatever that means, um, because of chocolate consumption. That makes sense to everybody? All right. So talk about an association. So an association is any relationship, some kind of link, anything. Okay, so that's the kind of lightest form of these relationships. Um, so here's a bit more about the chocolate consumption. Does, uh, does this tell us more about their relationship? So in other words, like, is this still an association or is it a correlation or is it causal? Any theories? Based on what we see here. We're just going to assume everything else is true. Ideas? So I would say there's definitely an association here, no question. Okay. There's probably a correlation as well. I don't know if I quite go so far as to say it's causal. Right. Because we don't know what wasn't controlled for. Right. Like family history you know, et cetera. You know, if we have a whole bunch of previously healthy people, you know, we, we need to be careful of that. What's the difference between association and correlation? Not a lot. Like correlation is that you can actually watch them track together, whereas an association may be messier. So it may not be as correlated. Um, it, it may not be as obviously touching. You, you just have, like, you just have enough data to say there's something there, but not enough to say, Oh, you know, if I pick a random point, it's going to likely have the same random point on the other line, right? Or calculable point. All right. It is also a question I struggle with a lot of the time too. Is that like it's it's a pretty fine difference. Um, okay. So causality. So this um, is kind of the answer to that prior question. Um, so. This, you know, the, the author here, Joanne Manson, um, says it does not prove a cause and effect relationship um, between chocolate and reduced risk of heart disease and stroke. Um, and then if you read the rest of the article, why, right? So example, maybe not the best example in the entire world. Um, all right, so let's talk some more about association. So London in the early 1850s, Does everyone here know what cholera is? Yeah, so cholera, nasty disease, uh, has a tendency to kill you. Um, and uh, you generally pick it up. Well, let's not tell you any more about it if you don't know already, um, because we'll get to it. So cholera hit uh, particularly England um, in the 1850s, uh, and then more specifically, particularly London. Uh, and it was doing a lot of damage. So at the time, 
right? Um, you know, all of you have significantly more uh, scientific information, medical information, um, than these people did. Even if you've never taken a science class in your entire life, right? You just, you know, significantly more about uh, kind of science and medicine and everything else than most of these people did. You know, there was a, a lot of people who believed that what were called miasmas or miasmatism, which was the kind of the, the that if you if you believed in miasmas being a problem, um, and then people who were who followed miasmatism were called miasmatists. Um, so miasma is basically uh, a fancy word. You know, there's a lot of words that kind of fall out of usage. Miasma was a much more common word, um, and basically it just means kind of like bad smells. Okay, um, and the, there were a lot of theories that cholera was actually caused by bad smells. Um, so a bunch of suggested remedies were, um, you know, uh, clean the air um, and a pocket full of posies. Does anybody know, I mean, ring any bells, pocket full of posies? What, is that, what does that mean to you? Probably more likely an American. Bring around the rosy. That song is actually specifically about disease and about the Black Death. I think it's Black Death. Um, and how you should put posies, which are a, a flower, uh, in your pocket to keep it away. Okay, so a lot of those old kids' songs, if you kind of look into what they actually mean, are really dark. Um, so I just always thought that was really interesting. Um, and another one they would do is with fire off barrels of gunpowder, right? So you would have the smell of gunpowder in the air, which would knock out the bad smells that was causing cholera. Um, and You've probably heard of Florence Nightingale, right? Anybody heard of Florence Nightingale? Any hands? See, anybody? All right. Yeah, so considered the founder of modern nursing, okay? So, you know, pretty pretty medical heavyweight, right? But she was one of these uh, believers, so she was a miasmatist. Um, and then Edwin Chadwick, who you're less likely to have heard of, but had a lot of juice, right, in the medical community uh, because he was the uh, commissioner of the Board of Health of London. Okay, so both of these people believe this very strongly. Um, and when this person came along, um, he was not really a medical background, um, but kind of more interested in data. Uh, and so he developed, or what he did was he actually made a map. And on that map, he filled in, if you can see the dark spots, those were places where people were getting cholera, okay? So as you can see, right, there's not a lot of it over here, right? But there's a lot over here, okay? And so we have a zoomed in version, um, which is just kind of that one spot up there, which had a lot of examples. Um, and basically it's kind of, if you if you can see it up close, right, it's, it's kind of counting, okay? So this particular building right here had a lot of cases. Okay, it's not that it was a taller building necessarily, okay? Um, and then fewer, you know, fewer here, but still a lot, you know, and then you had another cluster here, right? Another cluster there, very few over here, right? And so he started to notice these patterns when he made it a map out of it, okay? And just to give you a little bit of uh, kind of context, right? This, you know, this is a place in London, it's still there. Um, there is a bar that's actually named after the guy uh, kind of around the corner from the next bit we're going to talk about, which is this water pump. Um, and what he figured out eventually, okay, was that there's a water pump here. And let's see if I can find another one. Um, I don't know, there's more. Um, but that, that would be like right here, and then, oh, like there's one over here, and then there's one over here, another one over there. Um, and so, any conclusions there about? It's spread by water. It might be spread by water, right? Because in these days, right, you had to go to a water pump and get your water for the day. So, like most of you, I know I would go to the closest water pump, right? Um, and then there was actually an interesting bit where it's like one of one of these was like broken for a long time. And so these people were going to this water pump. So even though they shouldn't have been, 
they were going to this one and collecting the water from there. Um, and let me just check my slides. Oops. Can't always remember what slides I have next, you know. Um, okay, so. So he started to theorize and propose right out there that the reason for the cholera and its, its clustering was because of these water pumps and that something about the water was causing the uh, cholera in this pump, but in, you know, whatever other pump, you know, one that was over here, for example, um, wasn't. And okay? we'll talk about more, more in, a, in a second. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, I took it out, but uh, this water pump is actually not on the street anymore. It is actually in a museum. And uh, the TF from last year uh, actually has a picture taken with it, which I think is kind of amusing. Um, so, all right. And now for something completely different, because I don't want you to get, you know, bored. Uh, so we are going to go here and... So slow. All right, so you remember this from the last time we talked about when uh, the various names appeared. But so let's talk about Little Women for a bit. All right. Um, make sure it's going to work. Yeah. Wait. Oh, that was good. Okay. So, uh, anybody here read Little Women? Has anybody here seen the movie? Uh, actually, I actually think there's been more than one, in fact. Uh, so Little Women is a book about uh, basically four sisters uh, and uh, basically the guy who lives next door. Um, and if you are familiar with, uh, you know, English names, uh, very uncommonly, um, but in the old days, uh, Lori was not an uncommon name for a guy. So in Little Women, the male character is named Lori, so that can throw people if you're used to today where most most of the time Lori is a woman's name. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing we did before, is we're going to kind of pull out all of the chapters um, into a table, and we're just going to have that table is just going to be chapters, one per, so that we can manipulate some of that data. And so what we want to know is the first thing. I don't know if that's going to show anything. But so we have these characters, right? So we have Amy, Beth, Joe, Lori, which is the guy next door, and Meg, and those are the sisters and the and the guy next door. Um, and you know, should just wait something. Maybe it's here. So now the book is called Little Women, right? It's about these four sisters primarily, but then this extra character, Lori. However, what you know? What do you see here as far as the prominence of characters? The main characters. Raise your hand next time, please. All right. So, what you got back there? Joe's the main character. You're right. Okay. So, Joe, actually, funnily enough, and that's a woman in this case. Uh, Joe with an E is typically a man in the U.S. these days. Um, but so Amy is really the main character, even though it is um, what do you call it? Like a, a chorus, um, but you know, a, a whole cast of characters, they're all pretty prominent, but Amy clearly is uh, kind of the dominant figure. Um, and then so you can see, yeah. All right. Now I can tell you that Lori marries one of the sisters. Does anybody have a theory here based on this data? Which sister that might be? Don't cheat by knowing the book. So you think um, Amy 
because the, again, it's like the two lines are more like they're like they're like close together, right? So at some point, kind of here-ish, right? They start getting mentioned together a lot, right? Or both their names come up together a lot, right? Or they come up just as often. So a good theory might be that maybe they're going around together somehow, right? So another, you know, kind of given the fact that when was this book published? Like 1850 or something? Um, they're probably only going around together if they're married, right? Uh, so those two are probably married. And so we can make a theoretical guess about that, but it's just a theory, right? We, we just have, we can see there's a correlation between those two. And so we can make a, maybe an educated guess about what's going on, all right? And so this is kind of about exploring that data and then digging into it with more some analysis. Um, and then maybe we can try to think of some other ways, which we're not gonna get to here, to try to prove that, right? That they're actually married. Is there a way we can try to prove it? I don't know. Um, but right now we can say there's a reasonable guess that they, they have a, a stronger relationship than just friends because they get so much, so tight together. And that doesn't happen with Lori and any of the other female characters. All right. So we know you could have so much fun with books. Um, so the next thing you can do is you can start to say, okay, let's think about what we want to know some more stuff about these books. Okay, so how long are the chapters in the books? All right. And one of the ways we might think about how long that is, okay, well, we could measure it from a couple of different directions. We could say how many characters are in each book or in each, yeah, in each book and then in each chapter. And so we can figure out, okay, in, in character length, number of characters, we can look at how many there are per chapter. Or, and this might be more interesting, because when I think about something that is a length of a chapter, it's often much more about the sentences in that chapter, right? More than the literal uh, characters, right? Because, you know, maybe, maybe that book uses a lot of ellipses, right? Um, and so those aren't things you read, but they are characters. Right, so they're still going to appear in the character count, but you just skim over them, right? You don't really read them. So there's a lot of stuff going on in that book that may not. And sorry, just for the sake of argument, does everybody here know what an ellipsis is? All right, three dots together. Uh, that is actually a character on its own, or can be. Um, and typically, when it's a printed book or whatever, it will be. Um, so that's why I, didn't, I wouldn't count it as periods in this example. But long story short. Um, so I might actually count the number of sentences because that might give me a better feel of the length of the chapter, even though technically speaking, it's, you know, the number of characters is the length of the chapter, right? But, yeah. but what if there were specific chapters banned by the author that were designed to have very short sentences, like, for example, only three or five words per, per sentence before the whole chapter, then wouldn't that affect well, that's the kind of thing we'd want to discover, right? So, for example, you know, Huck Finn, that does not take place, right? Um, we have, yeah, we have one chapter that's quite long, right? But, you know, they're kind of nearish each other, right? We have one a little bit short, but if you imagine, like, of course, I can't, I, I know some authors that do that trick, for example, but of course I can't think of any. Um, but, you know, maybe you would have, like, maybe there's some real staccato chapters because they're trying to make a point, right? Or there's like an adventure happening. And so you you tighten up the, the words and the chapters and that kind of stuff to make it feel like when you're reading that it's moving faster. Um, one of the coolest things I ever saw was, um, does everyone know um, Edgar Allan Poe, the author? Um, but he has a really famous poem called The Raven. Um, and reading The Raven out loud is like amazing because the way the poem is written, it gives you the feel of a raven. Uh, it's really neat if you've never seen it before. Um, I saw a performance artist actually do like most of his works. It's really cool. Um, all right. So now what we might want to look at in this case is, well, let's look at this other book, right? They're roughly contemporary. So you would expect that they're probably kind of the same. But there's another interesting thing here. Let's see if we can have a graph 
that we can actually graph the chapters and the character counts uh, kind of against each other. Uh, sorry, the, the uh, sentences versus character counts. Um, and we can start to say, okay, we kind of are starting to see that maybe there's a cluster here, right, of number of characters to number of uh, characters in a chat, uh, in a sentence. Oh my God, I can't talk today. Um, and so does anybody notice anything interesting about this cluster? This probably will date you, uh, like predate you a little bit. But, um, it actually is around-ish 140 characters per sentence. Does anybody else know what is interesting about 140 characters? It's like the tweet length. So it was the original tweet length, okay? Do you know why the tweet length was 140 characters? All right, because it goes back to text messaging. So text messaging, which is formerly, which is actually SMS or simple message system, I think. Um, does anybody know why that's 140 characters? About a sentence. So it is about a sentence, but that's not the reason. Was it the maximum bandwidth of the cellular towers? Almost exactly it. So when you're sending messages to a cell tower to basically say, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm a cell phone. You're a cell tower, yay. The block that they sent back and forth was, I want to say it's like 160 characters was how much you could fit in there. But the message that they needed to send was only 20 characters-ish, right? So somebody had the bright idea of, hey, why don't we use that other 140 characters for something? And that's where text messaging comes from. It's just some random engineer said, I got this extra space, let's put something in it. And Twitter adopted that number because Twitter used to be all text message. So you would actually have your whole Twitter feed on your phone as text message, which was crazy uh, and un, yeah, unsustainable, um, especially the size of Twitter now. But I just think it's a really interesting piece of history uh, that one of my most hated protocols of all time, text messaging, is not only non-reliable, but on top of that, just basically a joke to begin with. And now it's like the most common used communication mechanism uh, and still just as terrible as when it was created. So that's what I like to point out about this because I just think it's super interesting that um, sentences seem to be about 140 characters ish, right? They're kind of in this range here. Um, but that has kind of these cascading side effects that you really can write a lot of stuff in 140 characters. One of the things I actually liked about Twitter before they raised the limit is it actually made my writing better because it made me have to write in a tighter way, right? Like I had to write less words, less characters. So yeah, uh, that's all I want to talk about with that. Any questions? All right. Switch back again. Does anybody know what, uh, and now for something completely different is a reference to? Monty Python. Right on. All right, if you don't know Monty Python, um, you should, it's fun. Uh, all right, so let's go back to causation. So remember we were talking about those pumps, right? And we were talking about where the water comes from for those pumps. Um, and so uh, the London water supply actually looked like this, okay? And what these are, this is one water company. This is another water company. Okay, and then there's some parts where basically the two water companies kind of overlapped. Okay, so what can we do with that information based on the other thing? We wanted to be able to prove something about cholera that is that it's not miasmas, maybe it's related to water. What could we do? Water sampling. Say again. Water sampling. Water sampling. So, so can you elaborate on that? Don't forget, we don't have any tests, so we can't like I can't go sample the water and see if it has cholera in it. So you pick water and and you test it yourself. <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, you're exactly right, except not myself.
Yeah. Uh, we could match the uh, areas that have the most color. Right. So we can do it through observation, right? So we can say, okay, where on this map do people get cholera, right? And then say, okay, we can theorize, and it's potentially got a little bit of flaw, right? Because of like broken pumps, like I talked about before. But we can say, hey, if the people who are getting water from these pumps have more cholera than people who are getting water from these pumps, then maybe it's something about this water, right? All right, so what we can do is we can do a comparison, right? And so now we have two treatment groups, right? We have, and I can never remember the name of these companies, um, which is the Southwark and Vauxhall water company people who are drinking that. And we have the, the other group, which is the Lambda. Okay. And so the treatment is what we do here is we have what's called a control group. Okay. Which is a, the group that you are not treating. Okay. And then, um, and then you have the treatment group. Okay. The bullets on this are a little weird. Um, but so we have a treatment group and a control group. The control group, and this should be like pushed in, um, does not receive the treatment, but the treatment group does. So in this case, it's a little wonky in the explanation for that, in that the treatment group is the ones, let's just say, are the ones drinking water from Lambeth, and the control group are the ones drinking water from the other, uh, the other company. Does that make sense? So we're just declaring the treatment to be one of the water companies, even though they're both drinking water, right? All right, so what Snow did was he first had to kind of frame the problem, right? Which is that in London, if you take all the houses, there's no material difference between the people who live in the different houses in terms of whether or not they get cholera. All right. Why do you think he can make that statement and have it be believed, let's say? Oh, sorry, I thought you had your hand up. Any ideas? Oh, sorry. Just repeat your question. Sure. What, what about this scenario makes this potentially true? Sure. All the variables except for the water is controlled by the experiments. How is it controlled? So this is where we're getting out there a little bit, right? Sample size. If you take a big enough group of people, there's a pretty good chance that they're all gonna be mostly similar, right? In the sense that how likely they are to contract cholera from water, okay? So if you take all of London, which is like probably even at the time, more than a million people, um, there's a pretty good chance they're all very, you know, if you look at them uniformly, they're similar enough that we can say that the treatment is just the different water companies. Does that make sense? Okay, so we'll talk about this more later uh, in a lot more detail. Um, and so we can say that they are similar except for the treatment, okay? And basically on the factor that the number of individuals that are being studied is big enough that all other differences will kind of wash out, okay? <laughs> wash. Uh, so this is what he measured. And he said, okay, S and B, number of houses was 40,000, cholera deaths was 1,263, and then deaths per 10,000 houses, 315. Um, why do you think that we do this particular column like this? Why, why don't we actually write this out as 315,000? Uh, no, 100,000. Uh, here. Um, if you do it for 10,000, then it controls for the fact that they could have different numbers and you can look at the rate. But if one is much larger, then it would have a lot more cases. Right. So, so basically, it kind of evens it out a bit. Okay. And so, this is a mechanism to kind of even it out. It's considered accurate because everyone recognizes that it's kind of evening it out. Okay. But again, this is one of those things that you want to declare, make very clear that you're doing because it is a little bit lost. Right. So in that this, this number is not literally the number of people um, who, who die, right? It's the number over here. So, but this way we can actually compare them 
to each other because when we have 256,000 versus 26,000 versus 40,000, it's these numbers are very difficult to compare. So what we do is even it out so that we can try to be able to compare them. That makes sense? So you've all heard the term probably per capita, right? That's what we do to even things out. So we might say, you know, that per capita, the number of people who in Boston uh, who are students is much higher than nearly anywhere else in the world, right? Per capita, you know, um, so that we can kind of even it out and compare apples to apples because comparing these is much harder, okay? All right, so which part of London do you want to live in? Uh, how about you raise your hand for S and V? Uh, sorry, raise your right hand for S and V. Raise your left hand for Lambda, um, and we'll just ignore the rest of London. All right. So you want to live in Lambda because it's a lot less cholera, right? So in this way, he showed that there is a causal relationship to which water you were taking in to the likelihood you got cholera. And I can't remember if I have a later slide for this. Let me just check. Okay, yeah, so we're gonna go back a few slides because I like to cover the why. All right, so I don't know how well you can tell, um, but does anybody have any theory about why Lambeth is where you want to live? Any guesses about the water? Uh, is it because it's right away from the river uh, and that was infected? Essentially, yeah. So the water that Lambeth was getting was from the top of the Thames, okay, or the beginning of the Thames, let's say. The water that South uh, Southwark S and B was getting, because if you look at their location, right, is from kind of the other end of the Thames. Okay, so as it went through London. All right, so why would you get cholera from the S and B water and not Lamb? Uh, let's go here. Yeah, sorry. The water had went through a lot as it moved through London, and so people who got the water first are less likely to. The but what what it had what had it been like through? rotten meat or any yeah other so trash yeah. all right in these days people would just dump all their trash including their you know they didn't have flushable toilets etc all into the tents and these guys took the water at the end of the tents and fed it back into the population these ones took it from the top uh, not knowing that this was not a good thing. So that was why. And actually, there was an outbreak of cholera not that long ago, uh, like within the last year or so. Um, and basically, it was dirty water. Again, same kind of problem. Um, so, uh, does anybody ever know the term confounding? This is one of my favorite words, I think, in English altogether, because it sounds awesome. And I think it's, it's also one of those ones where I think it sounds like what it means. I don't know. Uh, so basically, what we're trying to do is we want to get rid of confounding variables. OK, so in other words, when we were talking about the health you know, stuff related to chocolate and whatever the other one is, coffee, um, there was another similar study at the same time about red wine, and I mix up which one I have as an example. Um, so. What you do is you want to make sure that you're not getting caught up in what's called a confounding factor, okay? So, or confounding variables or whatever. So basically confounding is all of this stuff that you're not accounting for that is actually explaining your outcome, okay? So you want to control for your confounding variables. In other words, in the population example we were talking about with the water, um, con you know, confounding variable might be it could be something like rich versus poor would be a great confounding variable in that scenario because you tend to have richer people tend to live in certain areas together and poorer people tend to live in certain areas together. So that would be a really likely confounding factor. Luckily for Jon Snow here, I mean, aside from, you know, the North and the winter and all that jazz, um, it was, it worked out for him that the water distribution by those companies didn't have uh, like a bias 
towards rich area versus poor area. It just, it was all equal, roughly. So those are something to be careful of. Uh, they are very common, very easy to get snagged by, but mostly what I'm trying to point out here is this is the term that we use for this kind of problem, okay? All right, I think I'm almost done, so we're almost out of time, so. All right, so an example of confounding, um, clearly when ice cream sales are up, so are shark attacks, right? What might be a confounding factor on that? It's the summer, so people are eating ice cream, people are in the ocean. Okay, confounding factor is that summertime, there tends to be more shark attacks and ice cream consumption, but completely unrelated, right? Like just because I ate an ice cream doesn't mean I'm gonna get attacked by a shark, although it might be entertaining if it was true. So there's a very common other cost for it to think that seems correlated. Typically common, not always. So it could be that uh, the confounding factor here is um, everybody who, had, who is attacked by a shark always wears red. Um, and red is more commonly worn in the summer. And ice cream is eaten year round by everyone equally. I don't know. There, there could be there could be other like unrelated confounding factors as well, but typically you talk about them in terms of where they are related. Okay, so um, so summer, for example, right? Ice cream consumption, shark attacks, both go up in the summertime, but it's more related to the summer than it is to the ice cream consumption. Make sense? Cool. All right. So, anybody know what I'm going to say next? How do you how do you solve for this problem when you don't have something as simple as a large population? Randomization. Randomization, right? So we randomize how we put people into the two different groups. And I'm sorry, put individuals into the two different groups. May or may not be people. Um, so that way we can control for at least some of the confounding factors. We may not get them all, but at least some, we have enough of them and enough randomization, we can actually do it, okay? We can actually get good, good samples. And we'll do this a lot more over the course of the semester. Um, and this is where I often will have a rant about how computers actually don't generate random numbers, which you may or may not be aware of, uh, even though they tell you they're random, um, that it's actually very hard to get a computer to do a random number. Why do you think that might be? Any ideas? I explained it sort of in the last lecture. So just tell the computer exactly what to do. Right on. So because you have to tell a computer exactly what to do, you have to tell it exactly how to make a random number. Because you know what makes it so that you can make a random number? Your brain, right? Your ability to think. Because a computer can't think, it can't make a random number. So what they do to solve for this actually in a lot of modern computers is they'll actually sample something in, in the world um, while they're trying to give you a random number so that then it can kind of mess it up, right? So basically it can get it something actually random. A typical one is the current temperature of the CPU, like the part that runs the computer. So it'll actually grab whatever that temperature is out of a whole bunch of places and use that to start the randomization so that the number is actually random. Um, in fact, in, in computer science, we do a term for this, that many of the numbers that you get that are random on a computer are actually what's called pseudo-random. Um, and actually, there's interesting psychological components to this where you can actually affect the random number that someone will produce by how you lead them to it. Okay, and uh, there's lots of great examples of this on like TikTok and uh, various other like social media platforms where they will say, you know, they'll give a bunch of keywords or ask you a bunch of questions and then be able to predict what your answer will be at the end. Same idea. So both of those things are pseudo-random. They're referred to as, uh, but this is mostly a rant that is really part of the course. All right. Um, one last bit, which is that random does not equal haphazard, okay? So often in general English, we think of random as haphazard, right? It's just all over the place. That's not what we're doing here. We are randomly assigning people to a control group versus a treatment group. We are, um, you know, we're very specifically being very careful about how we create that randomness on what factors we decide what person goes in where, okay? 
So just random does not equal haphazard, despite what the dictionary says if you look it up in the dictionary. Make sense? All right, and then we'll close the next KCD. Um, so I think this one's very funny. I am a nerd. I used to think correlation implied causation, then I took the stats class, and now I don't. Sounds like a class help. Well, me. <laughs> so, uh, and with that, I think we conclude for the day. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in the discussion tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, uh, oh.